Welcome, guys. Thank you very much for, uh, for coming. We're very excited to get this going. And uh, before we do, there are just a few people I'd like to thank. Um, first of all, thanks to Professor McAllister for his, his counsel, especially early on with this whole process. Um, to the Office of Student Life, and particularly Kevin Garcia for getting this set up. Um, the Gaudino Fund and the Office of uh, Communication for providing us the means, means to film this and you know, really, really get it going and bring it to the community. Um, Professor Bernardson for helping to organize this, this entire process and serving as moderator tonight. Uh, the four, four guys participating, Michael, um, Burhan, Jesper, and Mike, uh, for, for make, basically making this debate um, and for all the work and effort you guys have contributed to it. And uh, finally, to the national branch of the Alexander Hamilton Society, who's uh, hosting this, for funding and organizing uh, this entire event. Uh, and for those of you guys unaware, it's an independent, nonpartisan, and non-for-profit uh, group dedicated to basically spurring uh, debate on foreign policy issues across the country. Um, and it's membership-based, so and it, it's grown very steadily over the last several years, particularly on college campuses. Um, and beyond hosting political debates and discussions, it's also it's like a, it's a great platform for, for internships and other professional opportunities. For, so if any of you guys are interested in any foreign policy issues, whether they be you know, economic or national security uh, related, anything in between, uh, we'd love to have you join the crew, so please get in touch. And with that, I'll, I'll pass it on to uh, Professor Bernhardson. Thank you very much, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to tonight's debate uh, hosted by the Alexander Hamilton Society. And before I introduce the speakers, I will introduce the format of this interesting debate. Uh, and we, will, we basically have two teams, and Dr. Rubin, who is uh, the visitor here from Washington, D.C., from the American Enterprise Institute, he has already gone to about 10 campuses here around the country debating uh, people at other campuses, and at all those campuses he has always debated other faculty members. But we thought it would make it more interesting and uh, probably more substantial <laughs> if he would actually debate students instead of a faculty member. So we recruited three students to debate Dr. Rubin. And the format will be that there are sort of two teams. There's Dr. Rubin and the students. Uh, and they, each team will have a 15-minute opening statement. And then each team will have a seven and a half minute rebuttal. And then we'll open it up to the audience, and you'll all have about 25 minutes to um, ask the panelists questions about their positions or what they have said. And we would ask you that when you are uh, asking a question, that you might introduce yourself. And also that if you would limit your comments to more of a question than a commentary in and of itself. And especially if you are directing it to a particular individual, or if you might you know, suggest if it's for a particular individual or for it's the panel at the uh, at large. And then finally, when we have had the 25 minutes of Q&A, then each team will get five minutes of sort of a closing statement. And we'll start with the students uh, with their opening statement, and the closing statements will end with Dr. Rubin. But let me just introduce the, the, the speakers. Uh, the student speakers, there are three of them. There are two juniors and one first-year student. The two juniors are Jasper Bod, the class of uh, 2015, and Burhan Aldrubi here from the class of uh, 2015 as well, and I, Mike Drucker from the class of 2017. And the visitor that is our guest of honor here tonight is Dr. Michael Rubin, who received his PhD from Yale University in 1999. And his dissertation was on the introduction of the telegraph in Iran. It's a very good dissertation. Uh, he has also written about four books, co-written and written co uh, four books, uh, mostly re related to the Middle East. And before going to the American Enterprise Institute, where he is a resident scholar, he also worked for the Department of Defense, who so was stationed in uh, Iraq, among other places. But the, sort of among his publications, perhaps the most relevant one is one that you cannot read right now. It's one that is about to come out in the beginning of next year, in 2014. And the, the name of that book is Dancing with the Devil, The Promise and Perils of uh, Engagement. He's basically talking about how to negotiate with rogue regimes. And most of those regimes that he's focusing on in that book will be uh, mid uh, 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 regimes in the Middle East, am I correct? Uh, or a and Asia, <laughs> more, uh, more largely. So uh, thank you very much, Dr. Rubin, for coming uh, to, to Williams College. And the question that we have uh, on the floor here tonight is, should the United States go alone in the Middle East? And so we'll start with, uh, uh, with the students, right? Uh, we'll have 15 minutes of student commentaries. And so, oh, Professor Rubin's gonna start. Okay, so you've, you've changed already. And so Dr. Rubin, here you are. <laughs> You know, one of the drawbacks about working in Washington, D.C.
is that whenever I'm under deadline, I have to get something to the publisher. That's when you get the call by the TV studio and you have to be a talking head. I have, I've got a face that's more made for radio. But I was doing this once for Fox News, I think it was, giving my 17 seconds of wisdom about Afghanistan. And I came back to the green room, the waiting room, and there's a governor there from a southwestern state who was going to be talking about health care. And it's all entourage. I don't get an entourage. And the, one of the governor's aides said, you know, you look good up there on TV. And I said, that's kind of funny because my wife had just texted me and said, Michael, I thought you looked fat, bald, and mean. <laughs> and the governor looked up from his notes and said, nah, I didn't think you looked mean. The point of that is <laughs> when we do the Q&A for this, no matter how mean or I may or may not look, don't hesitate to ask questions and really tough questions at that. Um, just in terms of the idea of the role of the United States in the Middle East with regard to unilateralism versus multilateralism, I mean, ultimately, there's no magic formula. But I would argue that the job of the United States government is to, first and foremost, secure US national security, at least the job of the US government to overseas. Now, we can have a political debate about what it means to secure national security, but sometimes that involves working multilaterally. But if multilateralism doesn't work, then sometimes we have to work unilaterally. And so I'm going to try to point out some of the difficulties and some of the choices which we have to make in that regard. And it would be all well and good overseas to be neutral. But if we take a place like Egypt and the US policy most recently towards Egypt against the backdrop of the Arab Spring, I would actually argue that President Obama has been a little bit like a gambler, a little bit like a blackjack player that only wants to put his, car, um, his money on the table once he sees what everyone else's cards are. And that may sound good in theory, but ultimately what that does is convince all parties in the world that you're against them because there's an assumption that if you're not working with us, then you must actively be supporting our adversaries. And so rather than taking the risk of supporting one side or the other, winning or losing, depending on who comes out on top, ultimately what you've done is guarantee a losing hand because everyone comes off distrusting us. One of the other issues with regard to unilateralism versus multilateralism has to do with speed. International organizations aren't known for their rapid reactions. And in terms of multilateralism versus unilateralism, there's been some very tough questions to ask back in 1990 when Saddam Hussein first invaded, um, when he invaded Kuwait. Um, we could talk about the same issue in 2011 with regard to Syria. And one of my colleagues up at the table will probably be able to talk a great deal about Syria. But wherever one stands on the issue about whether the United States should intervene in Syria, personally, I'm against it. You have the issue that what Afghanistan was in the 1980s, Chechnya was in the 1990s, Iraq became in the 2000s. Syria has become today where the conflict has become much more internationalized and is no longer being fought just by Syrians inside Syria. It's being fought by Chechens, Uyghurs, Germans, Swedes, Russians, Iranians, all, all across the gambit. Arguably, speed also matters when it comes to Iran today. And this is one of the big problems that comes to uh, the diplomacy with regard to Iran, whether or not that diplomacy um, should be multilateral in scope, even if the multilateralism of diplomacy prevents that diplomacy from being successful. If the alternative is that Iran develops a bomb, if they make that decision to do so, ultimately that raises some very real issues. The problem with intelligence when it comes to this sort of question is no president has enough intelligence on a very controversial issue at the time to be able to act with absolute certainty. So there's always a bit of a guesswork when you have a ticking bomb sort of situation. Now, multilateralism certainly builds legitimacy, but it also has some very real drawbacks as well. Take some issues relating to the international legal system. The International Atomic Energy Agency, which has been active in Iraq, it's been active in Iran. On some issues, it's been active in Syria. When it comes to international law, the devil's often in the details. The International Atomic Energy Agency might seem like a natural to provide inspections, for example, for Iranian nuclear plants or so forth, but according to the charter of the IAEA, it's only allowed to declare, uh, it's only allowed to inspect declared sites, which means if satellite pictures show a covert site and everyone knows there's a covert site, so long as the government in question says there's nothing to see here, this isn't a nuclear site, then the IAEA is not allowed to send inspectors there. 
This became an issue in Syria in 2007, um, before and after the Israelis struck an alleged plutonium processing plant, because while Mohammed al-Baradai and the IAEA said, you should have worked through us, by its own charter, the IAEA wasn't allowed to step foot uh, or even request to see that site until Syria had put it on a list of nuclear sites. One has the same issue going back to the Iraq war in 2003. Again, whichever side of the Iraq war you're on, that's beside the point for now. We're not re-legislating that. But certainly, Jacques Chirac had a relationship with Saddam Hussein, a financial relationship. So did Vladimir Putin in Russia. Now, when it comes to international organizations, there's a theory of the, organi of the international organization. But if some people are actively buying votes, then that undercuts the integrity of the system. Arguably, we've seen this most recently when it comes to some of the multilateral uh, diplomacy with regard to Iran. With regard to France's objections, whether you think they're wise or not, a lot of diplomats, both among the Americans and among the Iranians, are saying that the reason why France took such a hard line was because Saudi Arabia more or less paid them to do it in terms of commercial contract, contracts. And so that's just one more example of how the international system can be um, corrupted, if you will, by other factors. Now, this also happens when it comes to coalitions. Take Afghanistan. And again, let's put aside what one thinks of the actual fighting in Afghanistan for a second. One of the most intriguing and complex issues in Afghanistan are the issue of caveats. You have a coalition in ISAF and NATO Coalition Plus, but there is a whole office which does nothing other than legislate what every national parliament, parliament has said that that contingent can and cannot do. For example, the Germans are not allowed to carry anyone in a helicopter who's not German. You could be a wounded American, and you might need that medevac to get to the hospital. The Germans are not allowed to carry you in their helicopter. They will not. Likewise, Swedes aren't allowed to fight at night. Even the Americans have caveats. Other national contingents can use tear gas. Americans aren't allowed to use tear gas in Afghanistan. And that goes back to the US Congress. So ultimately, the more multilateral you are, the more complex the situation can be. The question then becomes whether that complexity and the legitimacy that comes from the multilateralism is worth the drawback of um, the lowest common denominator or so forth. Another prime example from history was the Mujahideen struggle against the Soviet invasion in Afghanistan in 1979. This came eight years after Pakistan lost half of its country when what's now Bangladesh succeeded. And so, the, I mean, forget all the Hollywood notions about the Americans going around shipping weapons to the Mujahideen. That's not the way it worked. Afghanistan's a landlocked country. The Afghans said, um, Saudi Arabia, you give us money. America, you give us weapons. And the Pakistanis, we're going to be the ones who distributed them. And the Pakistanis, because they saw radical Islamism as the glue to hold their country together, decided that they were going to unilaterally support only the so-called Peshawar Seven. Some were Tajik, some were Pashtun. They all had long beards and had a much more conservative view of Afghan society than many of the other politicians. Now, um, when it comes to other problems, in the international legal community and so forth. Let's take terrorism. Again, we can talk about whether the global war on terrorism during the Bush administration was a wise thing or not. But what exactly is terrorism? In 1988, Western security services and police and so forth, so I mean Western Europe, the United States, and Australia, had about 100 different definitions of terrorism. About two years ago, that number had reached more than 250 different definitions of terrorism. But there's no one internationally accepted norm as to what terrorism is. Too often in the region, especially in the Middle East, people tend to take what I would call as the a la carte approach to terrorism. Terrorism is always bad, unless it happens to be for a cause with which we agree. Now, what I would argue when it comes to unilateralism is the United States has to operate, forget all the moral equivalents and so forth, with the notion of what terrorism is. I would say something simple. It's a deliberate targeting of civilians for political gain. Well, we should be able to use our force and our economic force, our diplomatic force, to, for example, say to Turkey, we are not going to provide you any counterterrorism assistance unless you first sign on and agree to what this definition of terrorism is. You can't expect our help against the PKK if you're going to support Hamas for example, or the Anusra Front in Syria. 
And ultimately, that's a way in which American unilateralism can arguably advance the notion of international law. Now, when it comes to other issues in the international community, you know, take the Durban Conference on Racism and Xenophobia and so forth, which many people, including many of the organizers, will acknowledge devolved into a farce of what it was supposed to be. It became a forum for a great deal of xenophobia and racism and so forth. The Canadians walked out, and when I was talking to the Canadian delegation, when they announced they were going to walk out, they said, look, I mean, it's one thing for us to walk out, and we can pat ourselves on the back on principle, just like the Canadians have when it came, comes to human rights with regard to Iran, where they're one of the most active voices. But ultimately, there's no other United States, and what the United States chooses to do or not do matters. This has come to play when it comes to the United Nations Human Rights Council, um, where the United States walked out, and then we, re re we rejoined the New Form Council, um, giving it our imprimatur. And just last week, they, I mean, they elected Saudi Arabia, China, Russia, Venezuela to be on this United Nations Human Rights Council, which again makes a mockery which the United States seems to be endorsing. And the last thing I'll point to uh, is the issue of capability. The United States has a capability that many other countries don't have. I would argue that the largest humanitarian organization in the world is actually the United States military. We see this when it comes to the George Washington Strike Carrier Strike Group, which is now deployed off the Philippines. We see this with regard to the response to the tsunami. Simply put, the United States has a lot of material at its disposal that other countries and the United Nations doesn't have. The question is then one of sovereignty. Are we willing to put these military forces under the control of non-Americans, of the United Nations. Back before the Iraq War in 2003, the United Nations actually wanted to fly Amer Americans to fly American planes over Iraq without any arms on them or without any escorts. And this is at a time when the Iraqis were shooting at planes over the no-fly no zone. And so ultimately, the United States said, no, we're not going to paint our F-18s blue. Um, but this is one of those issues. Um, and we could also, I'll, I'll just conclude by talking, this is also one of the issues that plays into the drone war. And there's positives and negatives to the drone war, but ultimately the reason the drones exist is because of the failure of the international community. Drones exist, even though there's backlash from them, to take out terrorists or alleged terrorists in places that to otherwise reach them would take tens of thousands of US troops going over inhospitable territory. Um, ultimately, we can sit and debate about whether these guys are terrorists or not, but the United Nations will never come to a conclusion because there's no definition of terrorism. Or if we feel that there's a ticking bomb, then we simply need to act. I'll address some of the other issues during the rebuttal, but let me turn the floor over to my colleagues uh, from Williams. Thank you. To start this debate, we believe it is important to identify the overarching aims of United States foreign policy in the Middle East. If we can agree that these aims constitute the core interests of the U.S. and the region, we will have a common standard by which to judge the effectiveness of each paradigm in achieving our foreign policy goals, in addition to economic ramifications. We believe that the principal concerns of U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East fall under, one, the mitigation of the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, two, the minimization of terrorism, and three, the protection of U.S. economic interests in the region. Due to various factors, most notably fiscal overextension and political paralysis, the American empire is in decline. As time goes on, this will become steadily more obvious as the deficit grows to pre-sequestration levels and higher, and the government is forced to cut spending. Furthermore, although this decline may be gradual and protracted, there is no denying the fact that China is rapidly growing as an economic and political power to rival the U.S. As a result, the global political order is changing. Already, we are seeing in places like Syria that the United States does not have the power to bend the world to its will, and that it is becoming increasingly dependent on the support or at least goodwill of other world powers. In the context of the increasingly multipolar political arena, U.S. foreign policy must adapt. Indeed, it already has, at least to a certain extent. 
We must refocus action around our most vital interests. In the past few years, as the U.S. has discovered vast new domestic reserves of oil and natural gas, it has transitioned from an economy that had imported the majority of the resources from the Middle East, thus granting it enormous economic importance, to a net exporter of these goods. This is reflected in President Obama's recent statement that in response to changing economic interests, U.S. foreign policy must pivot towards Asia. Thus, our principal remaining interests in the Middle East hinge on U.S. security, the non-proliferation of WMDs, and the minimization of the terrorist threat. In this debate, we will demonstrate that multilateralism is equally effective, if not more effective, than unilateralism in achieving these ends, which are priorities not only for the United States, but for the majority of developed countries. In addition, we will show that a shift towards multilateralism will increase U.S. diplomatic power by fostering great, a greater legitimacy in the eyes of its peers. There is no doubt that the U.S. is massively overextended fiscally, a reality that unless major changes occur, unlikely given the partisan gridlock in Washington, will only escalate as time goes on. The cost of entitlements, which collectively constitute about half of the U.S. budget, is expected to increase steadily over the next few decades. An aging population accompanied by rapidly increasing medical costs means that not only will the cost of these programs increase sharply, but that because the tax-paying population that pays for the benefits of the elderly and impoverished is shrinking, these programs are not only growing more and more expensive, but also increasingly underfunded. Furthermore, the money that the U.S. spends on servicing its debt is said to increase dramatically in the near future. The interest rate at which the United States currently borrowed is one, it borrows is one of the lowest in the world because U.S. Treasury bonds are considered the safest investments in the world and consequently have the lowest rates of return for investors. As the market stabilizes, demand for U.S. bonds, which increased dramatically in the aftermath of the 2008 financial crisis, will decrease and consequently the interest rate on bonds will rise. More importantly, because of the partisan gridlock in Washington, which shows no sign of easing, the U.S. has been and will continue to be ineffective in resolving the underlying causes of the debt deficit while exhibiting, exhibiting a frightening willingness to make small roadblocks potential economic catastrophes. As a result, we are seeing credit agencies like S&P downgrade U.S. bonds, a trend that will progress as time goes on, undermining the reputation of U.S. Treasury bonds as the safest investments in the world, causing interest rates and consequently the U.S. cost of borrowing to soar. These enormous increases in costs will force the United States to cut spending. Politically, foreign policy will be the easiest area in which to do this. Numerous polls have shown that Americans favor cutting defense spending over entitlements, and the recent sequestration included large cuts to the defense budget while leaving entitlements untouched. Furthermore, defense falls under the category of discretionary spending and thus can be cut more easily than entitlement programs whose funding is mandatory. As a result, the U.S. will be forced to take a more frugal approach to foreign policy. Nation-building operations like Iraq and Afghanistan will cease, and indeed have already ceased to be politically viable. Americans simply will not support foreign adventurism while at the same time being forced to embrace domestic fiscal austerity, and political parties know this. In light of its fiscal situation, the United States needs to shift towards a new foreign policy model, one whose sole purpose is, to, um, is, so, um, whose purpose is solely to secure only the most vital interests of the United States through the most efficient means possible. This means shifting away from the use of military fo force, focusing on training our allies' militaries to defend them rather than keeping them dependent on a big brother to rescue them. It also means investing ourselves in multilateralism and diplomacy. Multilateral initiatives will be the only politically viable options for pursuing vital American interests because the participation of other countries means that the cost of intervention is shared. NATO's recent intervention in Libya, for example, exemplified a scenario in which the cost of a multilateral operation are shared. Furthermore, in our increasingly multipolar world, it will be more and more important for the United States to get countries like Russia and China to at least sign off on the intervention, even if they aren't participating, to assure that they will not actively oppose the United States and thus increase the cost of acting. Multilateralism is also the key to successful nonviolent coercion through measures such as sanctions, which are much less costly to the United States than putting boots on the ground. Diplomatic power, the ability of the United States to convince inter the international community to support its initiatives, both military and non-military, is becoming more and more central to American foreign policy as it seeks to reduce its financial investment in the Middle East through multilateralism. While unilateral action erodes U.S. diplomatic power, multilateralism strengthens it. Unilateralism does not exhibit leadership, but rather an arrogant disregard for the rest of the world that undermines our relationships with everyone except for unconditional allies. In the aftermath of 9-11, the entire world rallied around, behind the United States, and the U.S. had no trouble gaining multilateral support from the U.N. Security Council and from the armed forces of numerous countries to invade Afghanistan. When two years later, the U.S. acted unilaterally in Iraq, despite the objections of, among others, France, Russia, and China, and despite a lack of authorization from the Security Council, opinion of the United States plummeted, causing the U.S. to lose some of its ability to persuade others to approve multilateral action. The mindset that you're either with us or against us arrogantly asserted that the U.S. didn't need allies, that it could take care of everything on its own. Well, the more we act unilaterally, the more alone we will be. Our recent inability to persuade Russia and China to act more strongly on Syria reflects this reality. 
The fact is that unilateral action greatly hurts the chances of future multilateral cooperation, something that will be of the greatest importance in our cash-strapped foreign policy future. A shift towards multilateralism will affirm U.S. respect for the rest of the international community, including growing powers Russia and China, as well as a willingness to compromise and work together around vital interests shared by all developed countries. As a result, other world powers will be inclined more favorably towards the United States, and its diplomatic power will be strengthened. Um, in, in Syria right now, uh, there are uh, various forces playing uh, the political slash violent game uh, that's been going on for the past two years. Uh, one of the main reasons uh, we've had such a, uh, a rise in uh, different entities in Syria that both act autonomously and act on, on behalf of uh, foreign powers that are actively intervening in Syria is because there's been a, a, a power vacuum that has resulted in the past two years. This power vacuum came essentially because uh, the Syrian government itself lost legitimacy with the Syrian people and because um, the, uh, there, there aren't any institutions backing the rebels in the country and the, um, the extremists in the country as well uh, don't, have, don't have any legitimate grounds uh, to which they are uh, uh, fighting in Syria. If the United States had intervened unilaterally in uh, around August 28th, well, I rec recognize that Dr. Rubin does not um, uh, agree that uh, America should have intervened in, in Syria, it's, it, would, it would still have been a unilateral action, specifically, uh, because no other country wanted to help the United States other than France. Um, if ha it had attacked, it would have caused even a larger power vacuum. And we've seen in Afghanistan, in the mountains between uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan, specifically the Pakhtun regions, how this power vacuum um, sponsored uh, uh, the radicalization of different uh, indigenous groups there, as well as making Taliban uh, not only a, a force that was uh, strong enough to resist the United States for the time they did, but also a force that the people uh, 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 went to for support. I mean, these are the people who gave uh, Afghanis and Pakistanis um, uh, um, a, a, around the borders food, supplies, and even uh, a personal education. In Syria, if America would intervene, uh, would have intervened uh, uh, unilaterally, th uh, that would have been the case in Syria. Um, you would have people like Al Qaeda, people like uh, people who are would be carrying black flags, who um, um, eat uh, the hearts of uh, human beings. They would be the ones who would be uh, um, um, providing education, and, and that education would be defi definitely radicalized and extremist, and food to the uh, Syrian population. Furthermore, the blowback that would result from such an unilateral action, not only in, and we've seen this in Syria, we've seen this in Iraq, we've seen this in, in, Afghan um, in Iraq and Syria specifically, um, would be tremendous. People who would have been moderates um, had, say, uh, a, a, a transition happened uh, through the country itself or uh, through a multilateral action that would have given legitimacy to an intervention, um, would have caused um, the, the blow blacks would have essentially caused um, uh, um, America to lose both lives, economic costs, and would have allowed America to incur costs that wouldn't, uh, would have otherwise not have predicted. The United States um, had wanted to specifically just strike Syria, and Obama mentioned that rep repeatedly. I want to highlight how, in a, in a case of in anywhere in the Middle East, how that is extremely difficult to achieve. The Middle East is, uh, is a set of countries that are integrated in almost every single way you can think of, politically, culturally, economically. Essentially, had um, America acted in Syria, uh, President Bashar would have been cornered uh, and we would have been cornered to an extent that he would have to act in any way possible in order to survive. But he, he wouldn't have been alone either. He would have had the help of Iranians, he would have had the help of Hezbollah, he would have had the help of, uh, uh, of um, Russia and China as well. They might have not uh, um, uh, fought um, Im immediately, but they would have uh, uh, I mean, directly, sorry, and would not intervene directly, but it would have given them power and the resources to do so. Um, 
For, uh, in the case of multilateralism, we have seen that Russia and China have risen to, an, uh, to, a, to a point that they have basically been able to veto the United States twice, publicly, uh, um, um, uh, in, in the United Security Council, in the United Nations Security Council. And through that, they've been able to show the world that they are capable of taking a stance, very different to the stance they took in Kosovo, for instance. Um, Russia and China are rising to a, to a place where they are becoming um, in, um, in, at a level that is contending with America with regards to uh, 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 with regards to uh, uh, your politi a country's political role uh, as a global power as well as economic power. Um, through those reasons, um, I feel like the blow uh, the blowback that came, comes out of uh, um, a unilateral action in the Middle East would cause America costs on the ground that would um, um, exceed the expectations that they would have had before such an attack would have happened. Thank you. Hi. <clears throat> Hi. Um, the primary challenge facing the United States of America today in the Middle East is the fear of proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. This has been a problem that has occupied the United States of America from 1991 and until this day. Multilateral institutions are the best way for America to face this challenge in the current uh, international environment. Through multilateralism, you give it, you're given access and to a framework that allows you to use multilateral sanctions, multilateral negotiations, and the potential for multilateral interventions in a way unilateralism does not allow. The sanctions that have worked best on states in the Middle East have been those on Iraq in the 1990s. Those pressured Saddam Hussein to surrender his chemical weapons following the Kuwait War, and as it turns out, after America went into Iraq in 2003, he did not try to restart the program. Um, they have also been very effective in bringing Iran to the negotiation table. This has been done through several processes and several mechanisms. The United States, under President Barack Obama, has led the charge of imposing some of the toughest international sanctions on Iran in history. These sanctions have forced, have put pressure on the domestic opinion in Iran and on their leaders to make sufficient changes and to meet the P5 plus one, a multilateral negotiation body, for negotiation rounds, which although they haven't led to any great breakthroughs of late, it's still good that we are talking and not just intervening willy-nilly. Um, another important uh, thing to discuss when we talk about weapons of mass destruction is the importance of credibility. So Ameri for countries to be deterred from producing weapons of mass destruction, they have to believe that America is a credible actor that will stop them from doing so. American credibility is only strengthened when it acts multilaterally and when it doesn't act unilaterally. One of the clearest examples of this is to look at the Middle East after the invasion of Iraq in 2003 and what turned out to be a botched military operation. In 2003, Gaddafi gave up his weapons of mass destruction program to the United States. Um, and what many people saw as uh, an act of fear that the United States would act toward him, a sign of credibility. However, had he waited several more years, such as the Iranians did and as the Syrians did, and seen how America was unable and did not have the capacity to complete a military operation in the Middle East, they would, they would have restarted it as well. In 2007, by all accounts, Iran restarted its nuclear program because it saw that America did not have the capacity and no longer would probably have the willingness to fight a long and protracted war in the Middle East. Thus, credibility does not rely on America necessarily doing laying down red lines. It relies on America being a credible actor with the willingness and capacity to act. Unfortunately, as Mike touched on earlier, America is in decline. Russia and China are rising. America does not have the ability or the capacity to carry out these limited strikes successfully. It does not have the ability to invade countries and nation build anymore. Those costs are too high. When we confront um, Iran and we confront Syria, we need multilateral support because these are complex problems that require complex solutions. That means, for example, that when America wants to impose sanctions on Iran, it needs France's support, it needs German support, it needs Chinese support, it needs Russian support to make sure that these are effective sanctions. When it goes into negotiations with Iran, Iran only wants to negotiate if you can get concessions. That's just what negotiations are. It knows America will not give it concessions, but it knows through channels such as the Russian and Chinese channels that it can keep aspects of its nuclear program, non-military parts of it, 
in order so we can get its medical isotopes or whatever they claim they want. And America does not have to lose face and face a Iranian nuclear situation. For all these reasons, it is extremely important that the United States uh, confronts weapons of mass destruction in the Middle East through a multilateral framework. The one time America attempted to do it unilaterally uh, in Iraq, things went very badly. And it turns out there wasn't a mass, mass, weapons of mass destruction there at all. And to touch on Dr. Rubin's point, the importance of speed, had America acted more slowly, had America listened to the United Nations, had America followed the advice of the weapons inspectors, America would not have launched the war in Iraq in 2003. And that is nothing to gloss over. That is something extremely important to keep in mind. So now we've heard both sides state their opening statements. So now it's time for rebuttal. And uh, each side is given seven and a half minutes for rebuttal. OK. I want to thank um, all my interlocutors from Williams. I tend to agree with regard to what the U.S. interests are, proliferation, terrorism, um, Middle East peace process. And I also agree with Mike, for example, that we certainly shouldn't be paying for China's energy security. I would disagree with regard to the inevitability of China's future. There seems to be a problem when you have exponential differences in income, for example, between Taiwan, coastal China, and then once again to the interior of China. That's going to lead to some problems into the future. When it comes to the oil price, one of the problems, however, is that the price of oil is oftentimes uh, intertwined in international affairs. And I mean, just for one example, it's not so much that you go to war and the price of oil rises because suddenly oils become more expensive to extract from the ground. If the Iranians, for example, want to increase the price of oil, they drop one mine into the Persian Gulf or buzz one tanker with one of their new UAVs, um, their drones. And it's not the price of oil that matters, but the price of insurance on the tankers. What would Lloyd's of London do? And that's what ultimately determines to a great deal the price um, and augments uh, and uh, impacts us even if we don't get our oil and our fuel from, from the Persian Gulf. There's other workarounds that we should certainly be working on multilaterally. For example, the Trans-Arabian Pipeline, reinvigorating that so that we can bypass the Strait of Hormuz and go out, out through Yanbu on, in the um, Red Sea and so forth. Psychology matters, and I'd also like to push back on the whole idea of a pivot to Asia. Most of the emirs, most of the defense ministers in the Persian Gulf remember in 1968 when British, Foreign Sec um, when British Prime Minister Harold Wilson talked about uh, ending the British involvement east of Suez. And there followed two years later the British withdrawal from the Persian Gulf. Most of our military bases in the Persian Gulf, in Bahrain, for example, are actually legacies of the British involvement there. Well, when we talk about a pivot to Asia, let's put aside the fact that we haven't done anything to actionalize it. Psychologically, it creates this notion in the region that we are about to withdraw with the rapidity, to abandon, if you will, the same way the British did in 1970. And that ultimately undercuts American interests more because it leads allies to make accommodations that might work against us. Psychology really does matter in this regard. And we certainly see this in Al-Qaeda's rhetoric, too, about how no one loves a weak horse. No one follows a weak horse. Uh, ultimately, diplomacy is actually um, enhanced, augmented, when it's done in conjunction with military strategies, when it's done in conjunction with economic strategies. Just like some academics talk about hard and soft power, in military academies, they teach the so-called dime paradigm, where every strategy should have a diplomatic, informational, military, and economic component done in conjunction with each other actually amplifies the strength of each. One example, whenever I ask a retired admiral, how should the US forces in the Middle East position themselves if we want the Iranians to take us seriously? In reg with regard to negotiations, the answer is withdraw the US carriers from the Persian Gulf. And that may seem counterintuitive. But remember, the sea lanes in the Persian Gulf are very narrow. It's very shallow. To launch a plane off an aircraft carrier takes about 26 knots of wind speed. And if you can't do that without going outside the international um, corridors, then you can't launch. At the same time, the Iranian speedboats can swarm us. And from the bridge of an aircraft carrier, there's about a 300 meter blind spot that you can't see in front of the aircraft carrier. So that's a real vulnerability. However, if we're off in the Indian Ocean, then the Iranian, or at least the Revolutionary Guard, would know we can reach them, but they can't reach us. And that ultimately enhances the seriousness with which the Iranians treat diplomacy. <clears throat> 
Precedent also matters when it comes to United Nations Security Council resolutions, and here we have the case of 2003. There certainly were pending UN Security Council resolutions from 1991, Chapter 7 resolutions, and if we had accepted the idea that we needed to have a new resolution, then ultimately you would have created the precedent in international law that Security Council resolutions expire after 12 years. That might throw the Korean Peninsula into quite some upheaval. Um, I'd also be caution about navel-gazing. And it's all well and good to say it was the American unilateralism which antagonized the Russians, antagonized the Chinese, but believe it or not, not everything revolves around Washington. Russia in Syria has its only military base outside of the confines of the former Soviet Union. And at the same time, there's about 100,000 Russian citizens in Syria because of all the Syrians that used to go to Moscow and study at Lumumba University and so forth and come back with spouses. Vladimir Putin tends to see foreign policy as a zero-sum game, and I mean, we have to avoid projecting our own values. Uh, this notion that multiculturalism is all about appreciating our differences, it's not about going into a sushi joint and ordering a mojito. Fundamentally, different people can think in very, very different ways. When it comes to the chemical weapons deal that Borhan was talking about, yeah, I certainly understand um, Borhan's point, but there are drawbacks to going the diplomatic route. What we did is set a precedent by not responding right away to President Obama's red line that basically said, if you possess chemical weapons, use them once to maximum effect. Kill 1,400 people and then offer to negotiate and you get one freebie. That's ultimately a negative precedent to establish for the international community. Sometimes when it came to Afghanistan, we've also negotiated before. Between 1995 and the year 2000, we met with the Taliban on more than 30 different occasions up to cabinet level officials. Ask Bill Richardson about that. Um, the Taliban had negotiated um, to not enter Herat in 1995, to not enter Kabul in the year 1996, and yet they ignored those, their commitments. Ultimately, diplomacy only works if both sides are acting sincerely in that diplomacy, and ultimately we can't assume that our other side um, is. Now, one other issue which Borhan um, alluded to is a debate about the nature of terrorism. Is terrorism caused by grievance or is it caused by ideology? If it's caused by grievance, then you address the grievance diplomatically and terrorism goes away, but there's a large school of thought, which I can talk about in the Q&A, that actually there's a much greater ideological component to it, or at least certain kinds of terrorism. Now, when it comes to Jesper, I want to argue back a little bit more. 5.4% of the Iranian economy contracted according to the Central Bureau of Statistics, but the, the sanctions, which by the way, President Obama opposed, the Senate overruled him 100 to zero, the effect of sanctions, were the banking and the currency sanctions, and that's what caused the decline in um, the Iranian economy. It wasn't the very targeted sanctions geared towards proliferators that were in the six UN Security Council resolutions. And by the way, the six UN Security Council resolutions did demand a cessation of uranium enrichment, which means when President Obama got up and offered to negotiate without precondition, congratulations, he's the unilateralist in chief because for the sake of his own diplomatic initiative, he completely obviated, waved away, six unanimous or near unanimous United Nations Security Council resolutions which called for a cessation of uranium enrichment. That wasn't meant as the opening position of, an, um, of negotiations. That came after the IAEA had found Iran in noncompliance with its Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty Safeguards Agreement. Now, we have had other um, examples um, over time, the IAEA gave Iraq 13 clean bills of health prior to Operation Desert Storm, and then after Operation Desert Storm, we found that Iraq had simply lied to the IAEA, and that's why we have the additional protocol, which calls for enhanced inspections within the IAEA. The problem with Iran is that Iran refuses to ratify the international, um, the additional protocol. But let me just conclude there. We can go into a lot more of this during Q&A, but I want to make sure that my colleagues have ample time. Thank you. So now, uh, the students, now the students will rebut, and so seven and a half minutes, so that's two and a half minutes each. Is that how you're going to organize it? Or? No. Okay. I'll, I'll just put like a timer here. Um, 
Okay, so with regards to the chemical attack, uh, I just would like to make, uh, with regards to the chemical uh, attack in Syria uh, by President Bashar, um, uh, I would just like to ha uh, highlight that the rebels have been accused of doing the same. And the UN, uh, uh, security, uh, the UN uh, inspector team uh, had found sites that uh, the rebels um, uh, um, uh, striked at. And the resources they got were coming from Iraq, and they used sarin gas. Now the thing is that the, if they would have attacked the uh, uh, chemical uh, production uh, 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 plants in Syria, they would have uh, stopped Assad from using these chemical weapons, whereas the rebels themselves would have still have had some sort of access to them. Um, furthermore, uh, um, for, in terms of the, um, the ideological uh, uh, back, background with regards to terrorism, I, I honestly agree with half of what Dr. Rob, uh, Rubin said. With regards to Syria, uh, Syria is um, over 80% uh, Sunni, uh, and that is a very important point for, because Sunnism functions under the ideology of, uh, uh, with, without sort of a hierarchical structure. They don't have someone who tells them what to do. They basically uh, function through a flat system, and each group of people who have one clerk can uh, take autonomy in any, uh, any part in Syria, basically, and make up their own rules and make up their own motives to whatever they're doing. So if you try and sort of uh, 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 battle them directly, you're going to uh, uh, find trouble because you can't sort of consolidate, you can't eliminate them and you can't negotiate with them. So you have to stop the people who fuel them. The people who fuel them are Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is an is a, is a ally of the United States. Yes, the government itself doesn't uh, uh, fuel them, but with enough pressure from America, things could be different. On the other hand, Shiism works under a hierarchical system. Hezbollah, uh, 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 for instance, uh, has Nusra Nasrallah as his leader, and in Syria and uh, Middle East, it's well known that Nasrallah, if he says something, that's, I mean that's what a lot of people believe. If he says something, he w he will always do it. He would never lie publicly on TV. His actions are always implemented. Same thing uh, uh, with regards to Ayatollah. So with regards to diplomatic efforts with Iran uh, and um, Hezbollah's threat to Israel, if America would barker some some sort of a deal with Iran, you can be sure it's going to follow through. Whereas if you barker any uh, uh, deals with uh, uh, al not nothing America would, but any sponsors of them, I'm not sure uh, uh, th that would ha uh, occur. The only way you could stop Al-Qaeda, I think, in the Middle East, which is a problem for all the countries there, is through uh, it's trying to get concentrated effort by all the regional powers. Al-Qaeda is hated by everyone. Nobody likes Al-Qaeda. Uh, uh, no one publicly, uh, no, no citizens in the Middle East like Al-Qaeda, essentially. If you put them all on the table, concentrate the effort against them, you can eliminate them. Today, we are, that's a great opportunity. They're in Syria and Iraq. And so basically, uh, and that's where they're concentrated. Um, with Obama's diplomatic effort caused Syria to be, uh, 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 to Assad, America's enemy, and Al-Qaeda, America's enemy, to fight to get, uh, each other vigorously and uh, essentially weaken each other uh, as a result. The people, the people, uh, obviously Syrians are dying as well, but America's enemies are basically destroying themselves at the moment. So this is a time where you could ga you'd gather everyone, and even Iran would work with America on this case to basically kill off Al-Qaeda completely. Um. <clears throat> Okay, so uh, to um, address uh, Dr. Rubin's point on diplomacy, um, where he brought up the examples with uh, we tried um, we tried uh, uh, doing uh, diplom uh, conducting diplomacy with the Taliban, um, and about the fact that uh, unilateral power gives diplomatic negotiations more credence. Um, I think, um, uh, um, not, uh, with all due respect, I, I, that's not um, the kind of uh, the diplomacy we were uh, we were talking about. We don't mean diplomacy with. Um, the individuals who would be the subject of the intervention. We mean diplomacy with our ally, um, with uh, not just our allies, but with other world powers um, uh, in uh, the Security Council um, and um, outside of it to um, pursue multilateral interventions. For, um, so um, that was illustrated by the example with Iraq. So um, when the U.S. acted unilaterally in Iraq, it basically said that we are we exist essentially outside of the international order that we don't need. Um, uh, that we don't need the support of um, uh, allies, that we don't, um, that, and that we're not interested in the international consensus. And as a result, um, uh, opinion of the U.S. plummeted, and uh, and the credibility of the U.S. also plummeted when it, um, they found out that the U.S. actually wasn't capable of 
doing this. And we believe that it, the U.S. isn't really capable of a acting successfully unilaterally in the Middle East. Every time it's done so, it's failed. And uh, we don't believe that this is a fluke. We believe that this is reflective of the extreme complexity of the situation in the Middle East and also uh, the fact that um, when the United States acts unilaterally, it provokes um, uh, a blow, uh, blowback from local populations. Local populations radicalize and um, respond to, um, uh, to the United States. Um, and um, uh, uh, that's what we saw in Iraq, for example. And uh, so as a result, we don't believe that the U.S. is capable of acting unilaterally um, in the, um, successfully in the, in the Middle East in terms of military intervention. And when it does so, um, it, uh, it undermines its um, ability to engage multilaterally with other, um, um, with other countries. Um, it undermines its ability to, um, uh, to build these, uh, to, to carry out successful multilateral interventions um, that are military in nature or non-military. Um, because it loses, uh, uh, because it loses, uh, right, uh, because it loses respect among um, these countries. It loses its, the functionality of their relationship. Yeah. Um, on the question of Syria and the red line that Obama put down in America didn't fulfill, um, I think we can all agree that Putin is not necessarily someone we like. But at the same time, he did help very much in getting chemical weapons away from Syria and ensuring that Assad no longer had the capacity to gas his own people if he wanted to. This does not necessarily mean that future states are going to look upon this and say, oh, looks like I get to fire off one chemical weapon and I'll get away with it. All I have to do is give up my chemical weapons program. That wasn't the result of this. What this showed is that the world is capable of coming together, aligning its interests, and ensuring that a dictator is no longer allowed to use chemical weapons against its people. I think that would be the lesson that future dictators will take with them going forward. Um, the credibility of the United States was in fact strengthened and had managed to convince Russia, a Syrian ally, to aid in it and removing those chemical weapons away from Bashar al-Assad. Um, and I think that because the world has these common interests, uh, the UN Security Council in particular has the common interest of ensuring that chemical weapons aren't used en masse or spread around, that we can see more successful multilateral action in the future and ensuring that the spread of weapons of mass destruction and their use is kept to an absolute minimum. So now we've done the first two rounds of, the, of this debate, which featured the opening statement and the rebuttal. So now comes to the audience participation part of, of this debate, which will involve the opportunity for you to ask the panelists uh, a question related to either a particular point that they made or a position that they staked out in this particular debate. So the floor is open, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, sir. Um, one, one issue that often comes up when I'm uh, in, in Middle Eastern policy is the role of non-state actors. And uh, this could go out to any of you guys. But what, what happens uh, if we take unilateral versus multilateral policy? And, and how are the, the actions of these non-state actors uh, affected neither, with either of those foreign policy uh, threats? Yeah, so the question basically was about non-state actors and how they weigh in on the unilateral, multilateral question. Well, one issue that's not just limited to the Middle East when it comes, for example, to terrorist groups and trying to bring terrorist groups in from the cold is the notion of spoilers. Uh, breakaway groups, and we saw this with the Irish Republican Army and others, which tend to be more radical and want to disrupt any sort of reconciliation. There's always a danger there, however, that you're going to get caught into a situation of good cop, bad cop, in which certain governments are actively going to um, promote, encourage, sponsor these, these spoilers, and a lot of this goes back into the notion, this is maybe one of the fundamental disagreements we have about whether other countries use multilateral organizations out of a sincere desire to resolve conflict or whether they are using them asymmetrically as a way to tie the West's hands while they pursue war by other means. Um, I think because the United States of America is as powerful as it is, it does have the ability to pressure both allies and even in some cases adversaries to approach these non-state actors in a way that is actually um, conducive to peace in these areas. For example, if the U.S. was to change, use its position within the multilateral framework, for example, the United Nations, and join in with China and Russia and recognizing, for example, the role of Hamas as a actor 
in the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, we may have problems with Hamas and the way it acts, but inviting it into the UN framework and having it reconcile its differences with Israel and Fatah, at least preliminarily, would be a way of bringing non-state actors in into a multilateral fra framework because Russia and China do, uh, in some ways, do support Hamas, either through their support to Iran, which then diffuses to Hamas, or through more direct means. And if we can, if we can align our interests with these greater powers, we have the ability of bringing non-state actors in from the cold and actually getting the chance to build more comprehensive peace in the Middle East. Okay, very good. Are there any further questions or concerns? Yes, sir. Can you elaborate on what ideological factors do promote terrorism and foster? So the question was about which ideological factors foster and promote terrorism? Uh, well, certainly when it comes for, to Sri Lanka and the Tamil Tigers, there's issues of, of culture. And when it comes to the Middle East, there's oftentimes issues of interpretations of religion. Let me give you a couple examples. In 1946, the intelligence office of the Department of War, which was the predecessor of the Defense Intelligence Agency, was charged with determining what the greatest over-the-horizon threats to the United States would be now that World War II was over, fascism was defeated, Nazism was defeated, and the Imperial Japanese Army was gone. And the conclusion of our intelligence analysts is we faced two over-the-horizon threats. One was communism, and the other was political radical Islamism. And this is a year before the partition of Palestine, two years before the creation of the State of Israel, and what they were actually looking at was the issue of um, the Muslim Brotherhood and the campaign of assassinations which it had undertaken in Egypt against people who were believed to be too Western. The other example I would give is with regard, again, fast-forwarding the Muslim Brotherhood, Abdullah Azam, who's probably the most important person that many people have never heard of in the Middle East. Now, he was a Palestinian who fled the West Bank upon Israel's invasion in 1967. He ended up in Jordan. Um, he got a scholarship to study at Al-Azhar University, went back to Jordan to teach, but he had become such a firm believer in the Muslim Brotherhood and its ideology that the King of Jordan expelled him, and he ended up in Saudi Arabia where he took under his wing his most famous student, Osama bin Laden. Now, in the 1970s in Saudi Arabia, this is at a time when you had um, all the petro boom, the, the oil dollars and so forth, cosmetics, color TV, um, Cadillacs flooding into the country. And there was a school of thought there that was embraced by people like Abdul Azam, who said that this, these elements of Western culture are a deliberate plot that were dreamed up in the bowels of the Pentagon to separate Muslim children from God. And therefore, if we say that, well, jihad is acceptable, but only in defense, military jihad, that is, then we have been attacked first because we have been attacked with this Western culture. When it comes to an idea like this, it's hard to negotiate away this idea of Western culture. It's more than simply just occupation or a land dispute. Yeah, I'd just like to add. Um, furthermore, um, well, I, I definitely agree with the whole ideological uh, uh, baseline with regards to um, um, a lot of the clerks that uh, spearhead uh, ter um, terrorist movements uh, in the Middle East. Um, in Syria, for instance, um, um, uh, I, was, I was reading this uh, um, with regards to sex slavery because in certain uh, autonomies uh, um, that has been a practice that started uh, in certain villages in the, in the north or in the northeast. And this has been based on a Quranic verse that basically says, wherever the right hand owns, uh, the, wherever the right hand owns, you can basically uh, um, sexually do whatever you want with it. Now the right hand, uh, traditionally back in uh, the olden days, uh, meant uh, uh, the wife, but um, uh, it also meant whatever uh, hostages you got from from uh, civilian hostages you got when you attacked a different village, and so basically uh, that notion is um, is derived from an interpretation of the Quran, but it's also uh, spread about uh, by the clerks themselves. The people who are in the villages are uneducated. They probably don't even uh, know m what most of the Quran uh, entails or means. All they're doing is listening to these clerks uh, uh, blabber and basically uh, listen to these clerks from their position of power. 
And so the reason that these clerks get legitimacy, the reason they're able to radicalize these, uh, uh, the, the peasants who live in, in, in these regions, is because of the power vacuum that results from either uh, intervention or instability or some sort of political uh, 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 distraught. Yes, we have a question there in the back. Uh, this question is for Dr. Rubin. So you created a differentiation or a difference between grievances and ideology. Um, I would argue that the way the United States is acting right now unilaterally in Afghanistan and Pakistan in that region is that you're actually turning grievances <coughs> to ideological differences, especially given the fact that Burhan talked about the illiteracy of people to actually know what the, what the religion is saying. So by drone strikes, what you're, trying to, what you're doing is it's counterproductive because basically you're killing all the civilians, in which case it is going to, the grievance is going to turn into an ideological backlash against the U.S. It, it, Matt, do you want to summarize for the video the question? Yeah, so it's basically sort of to what, to what extent can grievance turn into ideology? In yeah, no, and, and it's truly an excellent point, and it's one of the concerns which is out there. It's where theory and reality collide. Um, my response to that would be twofold. Number one, the cost of inaction in such a case. Uh, there's no magic formula oftentimes in international relations. The question is whether the cost of allowing a safe haven to exist and doing nothing versus the cost of taking out some of these terrorists, uh, which, which has the greater cost. And of course, some of the costs might be deferred. I mean, one of my big concerns, which you didn't mention, is by we're seeing a transition along the AFPAC border where instead of some of these most radical elements hanging out in caves and in isolated villages, they're going into the dense urban jungles of the southern Punjab or in Karachi, and that ultimately is going to be a problem we're going to face in the next decade. Um, my other response to that, however, would be, let's see what happens when we don't use drones when we try another strategy. And in that case, we have the Malakand Accords, which the Pakistanis pursued, in which they tried to cut a deal with the Teraki Taliban in Pakistan, the Pakistani Taliban group, on their own side of the, the border. And what we saw once they cut that deal was not only a neighboring, the neighboring area of SWAT did the number of insurgents increase by about a third. We also saw that the appetite of the insurgents was insatiable, and they started moving down towards Bunir and Islamabad, and that really convinced the Pakistanis that perhaps the way to respond to this isn't to make a deal. One of the problems we have, of course, is that most Arabs don't speak Quranic Arabic because Quranic Arabic, if, if, if Quranic Arabic is the language of God, if the Quran is eternal, um, that means that seventh century Arabic is, I mean, immutable. And this is why, for example, you have different, um, I don't know whether I'm stepping on Magnus's feet here as, as an instructor, but why Moroccan Arabs versus Iraqi Arabs can't understand each other because the oral language has continued to evolve while the written language is oftentimes frozen. It's like the difference between French, Spanish, Portuguese, and so forth. This means that, and most Muslims, of course, aren't even Arab. This means that most people are simply memorizing the interpretations of some of these most radical voices. And when it comes to the blowback against the United States, what we oftentimes don't see and this goes into the case of the insurgency in Afghanistan, the newspapers will talk about so-called green on blue violence, where one of our Afghan partners will open fire on our troops. But there's three times as many instances of green on green violence, in which Afghans are opening fire on the Afghan police and so forth, and we don't count those casualties as much in the Western press. So ultimately, when it comes to this battle of interpretation and breaking this battle of memorization, this radicalization that has come on the back of, if you will, Persian Gulf oil, uh, this is something for which more moderate Muslim factions tend to pay a much higher price than we hear about in the West. So may I just use my position yeah. here uh, and ask Dr. Rupin a question? Because I understood from your opening remarks that you were against the as, uh, proposed action in Syria, the American plans to go into Syria. Could you explain how that fits with your vision of unilateralism? Well, ultimately, it fits with my vision of what American interests are. There's a conceit in Washington, I would argue, where we oftentimes believe that we can engage in endless political debates and diplomatic and strategy debates, and that the facts on the ground don't change all the time when we're trying to come to our own agreement. I do think that much more unilateral action would have been more effective very early in the Syria conflict. And mind you, I'm not talking about occupation. 
The problem is with time, we've seen a steady radicalization from an uprising which had much more lo was based much more in local grievance to one that involves many more external players, uh, both diplomatically and frankly on the ground with fighters. So at this point, I'd argue, the analogy I would make is supporting Bashar al-Assad is like dying of cancer. Supporting the opposition is like dying of a heart attack. The question is whether the time for preventative medicine has passed. Unfortunately, sometimes that happens. So here, the time was a component. So initially, you were for unilateral action. But then as time progressed, you sort of Yes, thought. in short. And if, I mean, let me give you one very specific example as you, as you flesh me out on this subject. Okay. When we had a situation where some Syrian government forces were accused of mortaring, um, firing rockets and so forth into villages which for strategic reasons, ethnic reasons, sectarian reasons, they wanted to cleanse. Oftentimes they wouldn't do it from very close to an inhabited area. They'd go into the middle of a field because if they got too close to a building, people would come out and out of sheer hatred they would grab them. It's in a situation like that when there was an opportunity earlier on, for example, for the use of very limited air power. But that opportunity passed with time, especially as the chaos devolved and we were no longer talking about the use of mortars or the use of specific uh, Syrian fighter jets into one of machetes, um, AK-47s, and folks doing this on both sides of the issue as the situation radicalized. So uh, any other questions from the audience? We have, still have time. Yes, sir? Um, you've been sort of alluding to this a little bit, Dr. Rubin, but I'd actually like to hear, I guess, sort of what everyone has to say about what US intervention in the Middle East or action in the Middle East should look like, whether unilateral or multilateral. Lateral, wow, I really can't say that. Um, multilateral. Um, should we take sort of a diplomatic or an economic or a military approach or something else or a combination of those three? Just sort of what do you guys think is best? Well, let me be provocative, but not being provocative for the sake of being provocative. I would argue, and this comes to some of what I was going to say in my closing statement with regard to Iraq and Afghanistan, that the problem hasn't been so much the military force, it's been the emphasis on nation, ba nation building and aid. When 97% of Afghanistan's GDP comes from foreign assistance, that's a problem. Likewise, I, I, would, I would argue that the situation in Iraq isn't as dire as some have said, Television cameras don't lie, but they don't show the full perspective. Certainly, there's broad swaths of southern Iraq, northern Iraq, which are largely placid. Now, while terrorism might be a tragedy and a 1,000 people are being killed each month right now in Iraq, it's a tragedy for them and their families, corruption impacts millions. And it's that sort of corruption which nation building uh, sometimes encourages. And that corruption can also lead to violence on a much broader scale. You have some. I mean, we think sometimes it's a great idea to build a road in Afghanistan. But whenever, I mean, we've had villagers come up to us and say, don't build any wells, don't give us any wells, don't build any roads, because it's just going to cause competition over the water. It's going to cause land grabbing. And in some districts of Afghanistan, instances of land grabbing are over 170%, which means the same land is being grabbed again and again. Oftentimes, it's by the Afghan National Army, which means people flock to the Taliban because of aid. Also. American foreign assistance oftentimes encourages, or I should say undermines, the legitimacy of governments and the ability to evolve into a democracy. The reason is if we are building houses, if we are providing services, then ultimately we are fulfilling the job of what a government should do. And if they no longer have to take those responsibilities, then they have all the more ability to focus on things that are counterproductive, like armies and militias. Well, well, the thing is that, um, f I mean, I definitely agree that uh, there's, some, there's a form of dependency that occurs after uh, um, America, for example, unilaterally uh, um, nation-built uh, uh, Iraq. Um, and the reason for this dependency is because um, um, those reasons are all economical and have to do with uh, 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 the people just fe feeling as though they uh, need assistance to get anything done. But the thing is that in Iraq, in, in Iraq for instance, or, or how I envision the way things should go on in Syria, 
is that if, if some sort of intervention would occur, which I think should, would probably be uh, the best thing for Syria right now because it's not, it's not looking good, but any, any kind of intervention would occur, the, the job uh, of the powers that are intervening is to give the, the tools for the Syrian people to build the government that Dr. Rubin is talking about. The problem is that if the United States does that on its own, then th that party that would have been formed, or that government would have been formed, would have lost legitimacy based on the fact that it's sponsored by America solely. And the reason for that is because of America, the opinion of Middle, people in the Middle East about America. I mean, as soon as America uh, talked good things about the SNC in Turkey, they lost all kind of support in, uh, uh, around my peers uh, back home. And the reason for that is because um, um, Syrians have always been self-deterministic. I mean, that was the high, uh, biggest goal or biggest sort of superficial uh, 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 or the, the aesthetic sort of goal for uh, the, uh, Bashar, uh, Bashar Assad's uh, regime. He wanted to highlight how Syria is self-deterministic. There is that sort of notion in the culture itself. And so when they feel like we are uh, being forced or being, uh, the people who are ruling us were put there by people who have uh, hurt us in, in the past, they're, they're, go, uh, they're going to oppose them and further, further destabilization is going to occur. However, if the whole world forms a government in Syria, then what's the, what's the argument against that if, I'm, if you're coming from a Middle Eastern point of view? Because if the whole world, if the UN forms a government and then gives the whole, all the shackles to, to, to the Syrian government and allows it to incur the cost, allows it to enforce security, allows it to form an army and uh, build an economic uh, uh, framework, then uh, after, afterwards, the, uh, slowly, the, the, the country will progress and will be able to stand on its own. And it will be able to stand on its own knowing that it did so on its own. And knowing that the world thinks that we, w uh, the way our government functioned in the past was wrong, not America. And uh, in that sense, it's, it's a good thing uh, uh, rather than a bad thing. Sir, you have a question? Uh, yes, this is for Dr. Rubin. Um, you mentioned how you believe that um, American nation building is sort of a flaw with um, our um, sort of policy towards the Middle East. And um, I was just wondering, um, with regards to Syria, and I guess any other um, US action in the Middle East, um, Burhan spoke to a sort of vacuum in Syria. And arguably, an early on airstrike in Syria could create an American, an American created vacuum in Syria, as opposed to a Syrian vacuum as it is now. And I was just wondering, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, what you think the advantages of an American created vacuum are in the absence of nation building than uh, one that naturally creates itself? Well, two issues here. First of all, the assumption is that any specific airstrike would have created a vacuum. It depends what the mission is, um, whether there was meant to be a decapitating strike, which some people have talked about in the aftermath of the um, chemical weapons use, or um, some other aspect. If you're just going after very specific weapons shipments, or if you're going after um, with a no-fly zone or, or any other sort of prohibitive zone, uh, people targeting civilian areas randomly with artillery, then ultimately that's, not, that's just going to be drawing red lines. And one might argue, is it the job of the United States to, to draw those red lines? And there's good arguments on both sides of that issue. Ultimately, however, whether the red lines are the use of chemical weapons or anything else, there has to be some sort of boundaries of acceptable and unacceptable behavior um, in warfare. The other thing to keep in mind with regard to Syria is it, it would be wrong to see what's going on in Syria as sort of like the Libya Civil War Part Two. I'd argue that a much greater analogy to what's going on in Syria right now is with regard to the former Yugoslavia, or at least to Bosnia. Much of the violence we've seen in Syria has not been random. It's been directed at very strategic towns like Homs, or um, for the purpose of cleansing various cantons of opposition groups. For example, the, the Kamishli area of non-Kurds, or the Mediterranean coast of non alawis and so forth. Um, one, as a vacuum is created, one of the problems we have both in the international community and frankly in the United States as well, is we tend to be reactive to events of the past. We aren't proactive to the fact that no matter how the Syrian civil war ends, what we're dealing with is a change in the face of Syria 
as momentous as the change in the face of Yugoslavia was, and we haven't directed our policy to do that, I'd argue that if the international community isn't ready to do that, we at least have to put forward what we think our policy would be, even if that policy is developed unilaterally. So now it's time for our closing statements. So does each team want to have a minute to prepare, or are you just ready to go jump into the pool? So who's going to go first, the students or Dr. Rubin? Okay. Dr. Rubin, the floor is yours. Five yeah. minutes. Okay. I expect it. First of all, ultimately, when it comes to unilateralism versus multilateralism, we do have other examples in history which we can make, other analogies and so forth. But before I get to that, I just want to talk about one of the dangers of acting uh, or relying multilaterally is some of the greatest proponents of international law are actually armchair dictators. They will cite international law as supporting whatever they say, never mind that international law is often quite nebulous, or they might take action which might seem logical, irrespective of the precedent which that sets. Take, for example, the idea of reaching out to Hamas in the Gaza Strip as coming to grips with the, um, the overall situation. One of the problems with diplomacy with Hamas is that the Palestinian Authority exists because of various agreements it made at Oslo in 1993. Hamas refuses to accept those agreements. Therefore, if one then legitimizes Hamas as a partner, what you are saying is no, that agreements can expire after 20 years. And that ultimately undercuts the cause of peace if the Camp David Accord with Egypt can be torn up because the situation changes, if um, the Oslo Accord can be drawn up because Hamas doesn't like it and they're the new power in town, ultimately what that under does is undercut multilateralism in the guise of promoting multilateralism. But when it comes to Iraq, um, my colleagues have talked a great deal about Iraq. Uh, it's, it's a subject that's dear to my heart. I've spent several years in Iraq. I was most recently in Iraq uh, this past summer. You know, if you study American history, there tends to be a great deal of parallels between the treatment that Harry S. Truman had with regard to the Korean War and the treatment that George W. Bush had with regard to Iraq. The, I mean, if you look at political cartoons or ever visit the, the Truman White House down in Key West, Florida, they have an exhibit on this about how Truman had stumbled in, was over his depth, wasn't working with, um, allies effectively, um, didn't know what the end game was, had lost track of the mission, was ridiculous to, to work on this notion of democracy because after all, democracy was anathema to Korean culture. Russia, I mean, it was only with a footnote multilateral because Russia obviously opposed this, China obviously opposed this, it's just Russia boycotted the um, the Security Council resolution when this all started. So the United Nations framework is tenuous at best. Now, fast forward more than five decades, six decades, and when we compare North Korea with South Korea, we actually see a great deal of difference between the two. And arguably, that Harry S. Truman, when he left office, was derided as one of the worst presidents in American history. And every so often, historians will have polls about who the best and worst presidents are. Now he's consistently in the top five. I would argue that when it comes to Iraq, the mistake was nation building. The mistake wasn't replacing one dictator with another. I mean, we shouldn't have done that. The choice was to go for democracy. And in Iraq, Iraq has actively actually been a great deal more stable than many of the Arab countries surrounding it. When I was in Damascus, well, not, even when I was in Damascus, we talked about this um, over dinner, but earlier than that, in 2005, the joke in Mosul, in Iraq, where a lot of Syrians were coming across the border was, you know, about how Syria had its first free elections in 50 years, but how ironic it was that no Syrians were allowed to participate in them, only the Iraqis lined up in front of the Iraqi embassy in Damascus. And we had similar conversations with some Syrians and Iraqis in 2009 as well. Um, I don't think when it comes, one of the problems with the international community is there tends to be a de-emphasis on liberty and a de-emphasis on values. 
I don't think it's ever a mistake to try to A, advance American interests, do it multilaterally if possible, but don't use multilateralism as an excuse not to act, whether it's Bosnia, whether it's Iraq or elsewhere. One of the, I'll conclude with this. One of the most meaningful experiences I had in Iraq was, I guess, in late 2003, when I was in a governor's office of one of the southern provinces. And a guy came in, he was an American, who had been an, Iraq, an Iraqi American. He had been a student when one of his high school friends was arrested. And when you're arrested, whether you're guilty or not, you name people under torture. So he was warned that his friend had been arrested. He fled the country. And he'd never contacted his parents because he was afraid they would get in trouble since he may have been suspected of opposition activities. He wandered into the governor's office looking for his family, and I decided to tag along with him. And so his parents had assumed their son had been killed 20 years before, that he was in a mass grave somewhere. And yet, we went, we found the parents' house, the father opened the door and saw, and the color drained from his face, the son who he thought was dead 20 years before. The mother came and fainted. And pretty soon you had darn near a block party going on. And the fact, and I had a similar situation in Kirkuk, where a woman knew her daughter was in this town in Ohio, but hadn't talked to her in years. I had a satellite phone, we were able to call information, we were able to get in touch with the daughter, and the mother found out that she had grandchildren, three of them, after not having known any of this. The fact of the matter is, it's important sometimes to act unilaterally, not only in American interests, but also to provide a, a, a chance at liberty freedom and democracy, and unfortunately, that's one, one set of values which is always lost when it comes to the United Nations. And if there's any questions about that, we only need to look at the United Nations Human Rights Council and those who are recently elected to it, Saudi Arabia, Russia, China, and so forth. Thank you. So now we have, have the students. You have five minutes. Will you, how will you divide it up? Right. Two of us, okay. Our group really just wanted to show that multilateral action has, on the whole, been much more successful than American unilateral action in the Middle East when it comes to minimizing terrorism and when it comes to start hindering the proliferation of WMDs. I, I agree that Saddam Hussein was a very bad man. I doubt there's anyone who's going to say anything against that. But the war also took the lives of several tens of thousands of Iraqis. It is not as if they, they will never get to see their loved ones again. So because this person got to, and that's a very good thing, it doesn't mean that the US intervention in Iraq was purely good or for only good reasons. The US doesn't always systematically follow the norms of liberal values and the protection of human rights without the UN. The US, for example, opted not to act in Rwanda. It opted not to uh, withdraw support for Saddam Hussein when he gassed his people, the Kurds, with chemical weapons in the late 80s. So this is one of the main reasons there's so much opposition to the United States and the Middle East, because it is seen as hypocritical, it is seen as imperialist, and it is seen as selective. So I fully agree that if the United States would act uh, and align its interest with liberal value norms, it should do it at all times. But when it chooses specific countries to act in, that is when it engenders resistance, and that is when we get a lot of anti-US sediment. Um, and to sort of touch on the setting of presidents by multilateral organizations, the UN Security Council is the most powerful council in the world. I, they, when they set international law, they set the precedents. We don't have to worry about them setting one president because they can overturn it with their next decision. The decision to bring Hamas, the, 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 to leave Hamas outside of a framework for uh, the Israeli-Palestinian peace is not only bad because it, it's inconducive to it, but also Israel has not followed every single part of the Oslo Accords. Does that mean that we leave Israel out of a future agreement? No, of course not. That would be absurd. You have to invite Hamas in to the fray if you're going to get a comprehensive peace deal. Israel didn't follow the Oslo Accords. Hamas hasn't recognized them. So it seems we need to revamp this and try a new multilateral um, framework for finding peace between the Palestinians and Israelis. That was sort of just a rebuttal in the conclusion. Finally, I just want to um, kind of sum up um, uh, our framework and what this all comes down to. So um, I think it's pretty clear. We, we, at, the, um, at the start of this debate, we outlined the three issues that formed the vital interests of the United States. And um, it came down to, um, and when we showed that the US is actually an oil exporter now, it comes down to the minimization of terrorism and the nonproliferation of weapons of mass destruction. 
And I think that we can all come to, um, that we can come to a broad consensus based on recent events and and um, and uh, the recent past that the world shares our concern on these two issues. There's no Russia and China versus the United States when it comes to chemical weapons. This was clearly demonstrated in the fact that the support for um, stripping uh, the chemical weapons away from Assad was multilateral. And the same thing um, is true of terrorism. The, the entire, um, the, uh, the world is behind the United States minimizing terrorism. This isn't some, nobody, as Baran said, nobody likes Al Qaeda. No one wants to deal with, um, with Al Qaeda. Um, and I think that the, our, the clear difference between what we're advocating and um, what Dr. Rubin is advocating is that um, in recent, um, the United States has been involved in the past in more than just these two interests. Um, it, has, um, it has been um, uh, involved in other, in, in goals like um, spreading democracy um, and attempting to gain, um, uh, to gain a, a more uh, a trade environment that, um, uh, that, that benefits its economic interests. And we believe that that has resulted in the growth of radical um, um, organizations, in the growth of terrorist organizations. This is what has motivated them. Um, a question, um, uh, one of the questions that was asked was, um, doesn't um, our intervention in the Middle East contribute to this, ideolog um, to this ideo the ideology that fuels terrorism? Isn't this simply reinforcing the ideology that motivates people who might just, be uh, might just want to live their um, uh, lives um, into, um, uh, it makes them understand, the um, it, it reinforces the fact that the, U the United States is an enemy, Re um, making it more probable that they will um, join terrorist organizations. And we believe that the only way to avoid this when it comes to interventions, when it comes to stripping, uh, to pursuing our vital interests, the only way to avoid further radicalization of local populations is through multilateral action. As Baran stood up here and said, if the United States were to um, invade a country like Syria unilaterally, it would engender backlash from, um, from um, those countries. It would radicalize the population because the United States would be perceived as pursuing its own ends, as exploiting the local population and trying to, um, uh, to put in its own government there. But if we act with the world, if we act with, the, with UN backing, we will be perceived as legitimate because we will be perceived as pursuing not only the interests of the world, but pursuing also what's best for Syria. And, um, we um, uh, because we'll be affirming the norms of the United Nations. And we believe that therefore, uh, multilateral intervention is the only way to, perceive, uh, to pursue the vital interests of the United States in a way that doesn't result in increased, um, in, in terrorist backlash, in radicalization of local populations. And we believe that the world shares our interests in, um, in the, um, um, these vital interests and thus that we will be able to accomplish these goals. Well, thank you, gentlemen, for a very spirited uh, and uh, debate. And thank you, Dr. Rupin, for coming all this way to, to Williamstown, Massachusetts. And thank you to the Alexander, Alexander Hamilton Society for, for hosting this event. And thank you all for, for attending. And we look forward to future debates here uh, on the Williams campus. So thank you so much. Thanks.